session, I'd like to introduce Tim McMillan, President and CEO of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, one of our AGM sponsors. Tim, thank you and CAP for your generous support of the Canadian Chamber. And I'll turn things over to you now to introduce this next important conversation. Perfect. Well, thank you for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be part of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce Annual General Meeting and to be able to introduce our next two presenters. 2020 has been a difficult and challenging year for everyone, but through it all, the Chamber has been a clear leader on many fronts, a steadfast advocate for Canada's business community and the oil and gas industry. So I wanna start by thanking and recognizing the work of Perrin and the team at the Chamber through this challenging time. It's my pleasure to also introduce Premier Doug Ford, a good friend to and strong advocate for Canada's energy sector. He was speaking in Calgary last summer and Premier Ford said, when Alberta does well on the energy file, the whole country does well. And he is absolutely right. Canadians from British Columbia to Newfoundland and Labrador are involved in oil and natural gas production directly and through a multi-billion dollar supply chain that includes more than 10,000 businesses across the country. Um, in fact, outside of Alberta, Ontario is the largest supplier of the oil and gas industry in Canada. Nearly 1,200 Ontario companies provide goods and services to the oil sand alone, supporting 60,000 jobs in Ontario communities. These are good paying, high-skilled jobs in sectors like manufacturing and technology. Two examples are Chenaris and Sault Ste. Marie, who are manufacturing seamless pipe that is used throughout our industry's operations. And companies like Balladier Technologies in Toronto that are deploying solutions to help producers compete in a low price environment through technology and innovation. I am proud of our fellow Canadians who continually pull together to make it through this pandemic. It's been hard and it will continue to be hard. But with the right policies and strategic investment, Canada's natural gas, oil, and other resource industries can provide robust, sustainable economic recovery. They can drive a robust, sustainable economic recovery for the entire country while continuing to drive down emissions. We can create more jobs and communities like Sault Ste. Marie, London, and Toronto. We will need to do this. We will need more leaders like Premier Ford. Throughout the pandemic, Premier Ford has been praised for his Team Canada approach to his government's handling of the crisis. This wasn't a surprise to me as Premier Ford has been a Team Canada Premier since he was first elected. Again, when he was speaking in Calgary last summer, he said, I have a message for the people of Alberta. Ontario has your back. Well, Premier, thank you for your continued support for our sector. Our oil and natural gas industry will continue to pull for Team Canada and have Ontario's and our country's back as well. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce the Premier of Ontario, the Honourable Doug Ford. Oh, well, thank, thank you so much, Tim, for those uh, kind words and kind introduction. And uh, before I start off, Tim, I'll always have Alberta's back. It's uh, an important province, and uh, we'll always uh, support the, the folks out in Alberta. And we had a great trip. I just can't wait to get back to, back to Alberta. And I have to tell you, uh, folks, Tim has been an absolute champion for the energy sector and speaking out for workers and, and the industry. So, again, Tim... Keep up the great work. Thank you so much. And it's great to be here with all of you at this critical time in our nation's history. I have to thank the Canadian Chamber of Commerce for putting together a great agenda in the AGM. And Perrin, thank you for your incredible leadership through these extraordinary times. Everyone in this audience and in this province has played an important role in our response to COVID-19, no matter if it's you know, I go to these towns and we see a seniors group, you know, putting together meals or, or, or sewing masks. That's what we call the Ontario spirit. And it's been a, a true partnership during one of the darkest periods in our country's history. 
And in March, we delivered Ontario's Action Plan, a $27 billion relief package for Ontario families, businesses, and workers. A package with $10 billion in tax deferrals and other supports to give businesses the cash flow they needed to stay afloat. We also work closely with our federal partners to deliver a $900 million commercial rent relief program, the wage subsidy program, business loans, and $57 million to help get more businesses online. Over 63,000 businesses, tenants in Ontario have benefited from the commercial rent relief program. We delivered electricity rate relief to small businesses a 24-7 off-peak discounted rate for time-of-use customers, and also provided stable electricity pricing for two years for industrial and commercial power users. We temporarily banned commercial evictions and allowed restaurants and bars to sell alcohol with takeout and delivery orders. And while we continue to be there for businesses and help them adopt to the new environment, we're also making plans for the future. We are laying out the foundation now for our long-term economic recovery. My friends, in 18 months before this crisis, we added over 300,000 jobs to our economy and we will do it again. And I always say, you know, government doesn't create jobs, we create the environment for, for companies to thrive and prosper and grow and get the government out of the way and unleash uh, companies and give them the support that they need uh, when needed. And last month, this province added 168,000 new jobs, including 50,000 new jobs in the manufacturing sector. We now have more Ontarians employed in the manufacturing sector than we did before the crisis struck. These numbers prove that. Even in the uncertain times, Ontario remains one of the best places in the entire world to do business. When the world was scrambling for PPE supplies, we issued a call to Ontario businesses. We mobilized the manufacturing might of this province. We put $50 million on the table to help businesses retool their operations. And the response, my friends, was overwhelming. Almost overnight, we were making critical health supplies to support frontline healthcare workers. Ventilators, masks, gowns, gloves, gallons of hand sanitizer. And now we had a great announcement that Brockville 3M is setting up a new facility in Brockville to make millions of N95 respirators right here in our own backyard. That capacity did not exist a year ago and it's absolutely incredible. And the great news is, my friends, we'll never ever have to rely on a foreign leader, a foreign country to dictate in the middle of a pandemic if we were getting N95 masks or not. Those days are over, they're done, they're gone. We have enough capacity to supply the whole country. And others are starting to take notice. Ford Motor Company, is making a $1.8 billion investment in Oakville to create a global electric vehicle manufacturing hub. Roche picked up and we're opening up here in Ontario with a $500 million investment to make Mississauga its new global farmer operations here as a hub creating 500 skilled jobs in the process. And when I was talking to Ronnie Miller, the, the CEO, over at uh, Roche, he said, Doug, you competed against 13 countries. And because you've created this environment, we're gonna open up and expand and create great paying jobs. And my friends, we aren't stopping there. We have a brand new agency called Invest Ontario to attract global investments to our province. And we've wor been working with the Canadian manufacturers and exporters on a new campaign to promote Ontario made products. Over a thousand manufacturers and a hundred retailers have registered because it's not only about the quality and the excellence of Ontario made and Canadian made products, it's about supporting our own. If we can change even one in 10 people's buying habits, my friends, that's billions and billions of dollars 
going down the aisle and, and looking and picking out the, the logo with the maple leaf tells everyone that it's manufactured here. And it's as simple as maybe taking, uh, ordering takeout to your local restaurant or shopping local or, you know, making sure that uh, reaching for the, the maple leaf logo, as I said, on the store shelf. That changes billions of dollars of procurement. We can collectively make a huge difference if we all support the home team. Because I can be, you know, I can be here and, and, and continue uh, going out there, getting the message, but we need all of your support. And that's the difference when we all support these local businesses. It's a difference between business owners making a payroll or, or not, a line cook getting a shift or not, a mom and pop shop keeping their doors open or shutting down for good. And I can tell you as Premier, I will continue to be a champion for the entrepreneurs of this great province and this great country, for the small business owners, the risk takers, the job creators. My friends, no one wants to unleash Ontario's economy more than I do. We have made tough uh, decisions, I can tell you, and they're, they're tough decisions as a province, uh, putting in place more public health restrictions, but only because we know how damaging another provincial lockdown would be for businesses. We just can't. We just can't go back to a complete lockdown again. That's something we want to avoid at all costs. The healthcare system and the economy support each other. They're the pillars. But we know small businesses, those impacted by the lockdowns need help now. They don't need it in a week or two weeks or three weeks, they need it now. And it's why we've committed $300 million to provide small businesses with a relief on fixed costs for those who have been significantly impacted. And we've also heard loud and clear from the business community that you need more support. You need more relief for fixed cost. You need relief on things like property taxes, electricity rates, rent and wages. As we prepare our fall budget, we are building on the Ontario Action Plan we introduced in March. We're reinforcing that solid foundation and setting the table for a strong long-term recovery. And more help, I can tell you more help is on the way. And as Premier, I'll make it very, very clear, we will not increase tax burdens on businesses at such a critical time. I've never believed in raising taxes, putting a more burden onto the backs of businesses and, and people. I believe that we should be investing in, in companies. When you put more money into businesses' pockets, I know as a business owner here and in the U.S., you reinvest it into the business. You reinvest it into your people. You reinvest it into technology. You don't tax businesses. And the more money we put into the consumer's pocket, they're going to go out and spend it and you can get the economy going just like we did when we first took office. Our government looks forward to sharing more about our Made in Ontario plan for growth, renewal and long-term care recovery on November the 5th. I am confident we have everything we need to get our economy roaring back once again. We have the best and the brightest Lines anywhere in the world, right here in Canada and Ontario. We have the most innovative job creators. We are the economic engine of Confederation. There's no limit to what we can achieve when we all work together. If we stand united, if we stand as Team Ontario and Team Canada, we will get through this together. I want to thank you and God bless. Mr. Premier, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for all of the leadership you've provided throughout the, the pandemic. My colleague Rocco Rossi has talked to me often about the collaboration that there is between the Ontario Chamber of Commerce and the Ontario government and how receptive you've been and that's appreciated by chambers across Canada and certainly throughout Ontario as well. Thank uh, you for Premier, that. let me start with a personal question if I may. Um, we're half a year into this pandemic. It's been 24 hours a day, seven days a week for you and for your colleagues. It looks as if we're headed into a second wave. Now, the winter looks like it'll be pretty cold and bleak. How, how are you personally managing through all of this? You, you know, Tim, thank, thanks for the question. But honestly, I'm, I'm fine. What, what keeps me up at night 
And I, I, I might be a little different than some elected officials. I give my cell number out to everyone because I want to hear from the small businesses. And, you know, I'll talk to these folks. I don't leave the office till midnight every night because I'm talking to these restaurant owners. And as I mentioned at my press conference, I talked to a business called Crooked Q. They're a great, successful uh, business in Etobicoke where, where I live. And, and the, the pain that you have to hear from, from these business owners. And, and, and it, that's what keeps me up at night. You want to talk about pressure? I'm not under pressure. It's the small business owner that can't meet the payroll that that can't uh, you know have customers come in through the door because the government has, has locked them down that that's what bothers me and uh, talking to my friends out there I love talking to entrepreneurs like yourself I always say yes I'm an elected official I'm a business person first we're bringing the business approach to uh, Ontario and cutting red tape and, and regulations there's very few, and there are, there are some, there's very few elected officials that can say and look into the camera and say, hey, I've walked a mile in your shoes. We have a business here and family business in Toronto and in and, and our Chicago division. I've, I know how what it takes to meet a payroll, to come up with a marketing plan, to understand every month when I'm looking at the P&L statement, you know, where we need to go, uh, looking at competition. Uh, I get it. I, I still live, breathe, eat business, and I, I share the pain. That, that's what really, really uh, gets to me when, when we're out there and you hear these stories. That's heartbreaking, but I can reassure people there is hope. And when we come back, we're going to come back like this, this country has never seen before. I travel to them around the, the U.S. to a lot of different states with, I always say, one of my best salespeople, the Minister of Economic Development, Vic, Vic Fideli, and you hear the stories down in the U.S., Texas is booming, and people are leaving California to come to Texas. But when we went there, you know, our, our numbers surpassed Texas's. We, we have more job creation, more economic development happening in Ontario before this pandemic than any region in North America. But we can't sit back. We have to continue cutting the red tape and regulations. We're going to continue reducing taxes and hydro bills, and, but nothing is more important than cutting regulations, cutting red tape, which we cut about $330 million of red tape in our, in our first year, but that's where we need your support. You're the experts in your industry. Please feed us the unnecessary regulations to make it easier for your companies to thrive and grow. Um, that, that's what we, I'm, I'm a strong believer in getting government out of the way, supporting companies when they need it, but don't put this regulation and burden and the taxes and the electricity rates. We have to compete against all regions of the world. Our number one trading partner is the United States. We do $390 million of two-way trade, Ontario alone. We're the third largest trading partner in the world to the United States, Ontario alone. We're number one trading partner to 19 states. We're number two to nine others. But that's our competition. We're competing against the Ohio's, the Michigan's, the New York states. I can tell you, my friends, we will compete and we'll make sure it's attractive uh, right here in Ontario to do business. Premier, you um, sound a very optimistic note for what will happen to the Ontario economy as we emerge back into some element of normalcy. And in your press conference a few minutes ago, you said that the Ontario economy will be on fire when we come back out. Okay. Um, you have a budget coming down November 5th. You'll be having to make assumptions there as to how the pandemic is going to play out. How long do you anticipate that the current constriction will be? When do you think that we will be emerging? Uh, what sort of planning are you doing for that? And uh, uh, are you, are you confident that six months from now, for example, we will have some idea of what the new normal is? Well, Tim, great, great question, and, and thank you for that. I wish I had that crystal ball to tell you where the, this pandemic's going. I don't think anyone can predict uh, where it's going over the, the next six months, but what I can predict is, which is going to be one tool, many tools, uh, because it's not going to be one tool, but one tool is going to help us get back on our feet is this rapid test. The rapid test that we can do or antigen test, you might have heard of that you can get a result in 15 minutes. That's, that's one tool. So it's, and I think it's going to be a game changer. 
So those, those tests are being shipped in. I understand through our ministry that we have some that arrived uh, today. So we need to get that distributed uh, amongst the population, amongst businesses, long-term care, frontline healthcare uh, workers. But we aren't going to stop cutting regulations. We aren't going to stop looking at reducing taxes and coming up with a, a fair hydro plan, which, which we inherited uh, from the previous government, which uh, the Green Energy Act, I called the Green Energy Scam. Uh, they, you know, more more people. There was never a larger transfer of wealth from the rate payers, the hardworking businesses, and the people of this province to the previous government's political insiders ever in the history of this country. And we're trying to correct that path, uh, making sure that we can compete against other regions uh, in the world. But I can assure you, Tim, I can't assure you where this pandemic's going, but I can assure you when we get through it, and we will get through it. We will light the economy on fire, the likes of which this province has never seen, the likes of this, what this country has never seen. And what is good for Ontario is good for Canada. As I said with Alberta, when Alberta is doing well, the rest of the country is doing well. When Ontario is doing well, the economic engine in this country, everyone benefits. Thank you, Premier. Um uh, you talked earlier about the need for a Team Canada approach. How would you characterize the collaboration with the federal government? Phenomenal. Uh, I, got, I have a great working relationship with Christia Freeland. I talked to her last night again. We communicate uh, uh, a lot on, on a wide range of different things, be it health or, or the economy. And, uh, you know, when I, when I talk to her, it's, it's Team Canada approach. And that goes for all 444 municipalities too, because they play a critical role in uh, in the economy as well. Getting getting build, building permits uh, approved. Uh, I, I, I was out there and I was, I was telling our minister that uh, we need to start with the approval of the municipalities, start issuing MZO municipal zoning orders. We can't be waiting three four years for approvals. We, if people need an instant answer. They have to know when the return on their investment, when they build a factory, when they can start manufacturing, they don't want to hear it's going to take three or four years of red tape, EAs and this and that. So the municipalities play a critical role, but uh, my relationship with all, all three levels of government is extremely, extremely good. And uh, on, when it comes to Team Canada, uh, folks, I, I was down in Chicago. We had a couple of plants, one in New Jersey and in Chicago, and I tra traveled to 44 states. And I'd be traveling constantly before I got in involved in uh, in involved in, in politics. And they're experts. Let me tell you something about the Americans, which you know already. They're experts. Before this pandemic, you go into a store, it's buy American, buy American, buy American. We need to adopt that. It's about buying. Canadian buying made in Ontario products. We do $390 billion a year and it's pretty well equally split. I, I, we, they have 6 billion on us and, and we have 9 billion uh, federally on them. So it's pretty well split, but let's, let's for argument's say, uh, argument's sake, let's say it's 200 billion um, on our side, 200 billion on their side. Just imagine if we could change that by even even one in 10, 10% of our buying habits. When we're going down the aisle of maybe the hardware store, or local uh, retail store, grocery store, uh, I've been asking retailers, uh, make sure and manufacturers put that made in Canada uh, logo on there, that Maple Leaf logo. And do you know our experts at this? Frito-Lay, every single one of their bag, uh, bag of potato chips, bang, it's right on there. It makes it easier for for consumers to see it. I, I went into a, a, a Canadian Tire the other the other day, and I love Canadian Tire, by the way, and Home Depot, um, and I saw a paddle, you know, for, for up north, a wooden paddle, and there's a big sticker, made in USA. Why can't we be buying that paddle off a Canadian company? There's paddle manufacturers here. We need to put pressure on the retailers as well. Buy as much Canadian-made products as you can. I understand we have to compete, and there's certain things uh, we may not be able to compete, but there's, I'll tell you, there's a tremendous amount of things that we can compete, I can assure you. And we have the brightest minds, the best manufacturers anywhere, and there's nothing we cannot produce right here in Ontario 
right uh, right here in uh, in Canada. And and Perrin, I apologize. I kept calling you Tim. See, I like Tim so much. Um, I've been calling you Tim. So that's actually a compliment, Perrin. I I would be, feel very flattered. Uh, <laughs> Premier, um, I want to come back to this, this. I want to come back to this question of, of Team Canada again. Our success during the first phase of the pandemic was that all citizens, businesses, governments at all levels came together because we were fighting a common enemy, and there was a feeling that if we all worked together, we would get through out the other end of the tunnel. And people were hopeful in in uh, in uh, the, the summer that that was in fact happening. Now we see ourselves going back in on the weekend. You had two days of the highest level of infection ever since the pandemic began in Ontario. And we've seen pushback in Halton region, Durham region from elected officials there, from business community among others, saying they're very concerned about going down, going back into further restrictions on business. Uh, we're hearing reports out of Quebec today that some 200 sports facilities are saying that they will engage in civil disobedience later this week and open their facilities against the uh, against the regulations of the provincial government. Are you concerned that the social consensus that's necessary to be able to fight the disease is fraying and is apt to, to break apart if people are expected to live indefinitely under these restrictions? We, we have to, apparently we have to be flexible as a, as a government. Again, I, I'm, I'm business minded. And uh, there's no one that fights more for small businesses when I go to the health table than, than myself. And it was myself that when I talk to the mayors, I always collaborate and communicate with local mayors. And uh, there, there was, you know, they were, they were getting up there and the mayor uh, called me up and, and said, Doug, what should I say? What should I do? I said, write a letter to your local chief medical officer. I told my MPPs to write a letter. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we are united. Do we differ on views? Does my cabinet differ on views and caucus? Absolutely we do. And I encourage them to uh, uh, communicate and, and come up with different uh, opinions. But I, I respect that. Wouldn't it be terrible if we just had a group of people that were one way or another? Uh, but I'm, I'm focused 100% on making sure we help that small business that, that is struggling. And uh, the stories I, I hear, Perrin, are, are heartbreaking, number one. You want to reach through the phone, give them a hug, and, and you know, give them a big fat check, but we're doing it indirectly. We're doing it by making sure that they don't have to pay their, their property taxes, make sure that we'll take care of their, their hydro costs and, and take care of their rent up to 90% with the support of the federal government, 65% uh, for the uh, employees' wages. And we aren't going to stop there. We have to continue supporting these companies, and I encourage uh, the municipalities don't just sit sit back and uh, as, I, as I always say Karen I feel sometimes I'm the pitcher and the catcher at the same time uh, I need that support I need businesses to come out there I need local municipalities to come out there and and support me when I'm I'm fighting back saying hey we we aren't ready the the ICU beds aren't at the capacity the acute care beds aren't their hospitalizations aren't maxed out. The numbers are low. Transmission rates are low uh, because it's <laughs> it's easy for some uh, chief medical officers to say close it down. But you know, keep in mind we have 34 chief medical officers, and that's 34 different opinions. I've always believed in good governance is seven to nine pe people around the board table. You could have 20 of the brightest people around the table. Nothing gets done. So they're working hard. Don't get me wrong. Uh, chief medical officers are, are working hard and they're great doctors but guess what and i say this respectfully they haven't run a business they haven't had to meet a payroll they don't know about sales and marketing they don't look at a PL statement but i have to balance i have to listen to the the health and the science but i also have to listen to the struggling business owners that, that i relate to i'm not a health expert but i can tell you one thing i understand business and I understand how to make a profit and what it takes to, to grow a company here and internationally. Look, let's talk about some of the businesses that are suffering the most. The a sector that's a very obvious one, it's been very hard hit, is the restaurant sector. Small businesses uh, across the country and in Ontario and several regions, we're seeing uh, shutdowns of, of restaurants because the patios in the sort of weather we have in Ottawa today, for example, with snow 
patio dining isn't very isn't very attractive. Um, are you satisfied that that sort of across the board measure on restaurants is justified by the data? Do you in fact have hard data showing that in fact trend, transmission rates within restaurants is a major cause driving the uptick in, in uh, infection in, in Ontario? Yeah, so the, the, uh, Perrin, the data that I saw is that in any area of, of gathering people in, indoors, it, it escalates the transmission rate. But in, in saying that, you know, we, we have to be flexible. What are we, we can't just be in the same, let's say, stage two forever. We, we have to be able to, to work around it, make sure we continue to work on reducing the, the cases. We saw a spike and the health team told me, you know, the back it usually is two weeks later and two weeks uh, ago, we were celebrating Thanksgiving. That's why I'm up there sometimes, Baron, I feel like a preacher up there, uh, just constantly reminding people to, you know, again, social distance, the mask and the hand sanitization and cleaning of your hands. but certain areas just want to ignore them. That's going to be a problem. You know, we, we see escalation up in, up in Peel and the numbers start uh, going up to a region of, of Peel versus Toronto with almost two and a half times the population. They're, they're almost keeping neck and neck with uh, Toronto. So that, that's concerning. And I just encourage people, you got to follow the protocols. That's the only way we're going to get out of that. Uh, uh, out of uh, where I we're at, out of stage two, and move into. I apologize for protracting this, but can I just press a bit on the issue of restaurants? Um, one of the things that yeah. we've heard from restaurateurs is why don't governments focus on the people who are the scoff laws, the people who don't abide by the rules yeah. and abuse them, who don't have proper PPEs in place or proper social distancing instead of shutting everybody down? Is that not a feasible route for the government to take? I think it's a very feasible route. We, we're doing more inspections. We've done 26,000 inspections from the Ministry of Labor. We need to go in, in there and not, not per se punish people, educate people. And they've been doing that. They go in there, they give them a warning and, and show them what they should be doing, what they can't do. And, uh, you know, I don't disagree with that approach. And that's why I had a, a meeting right before I got here with my Minister of Health um, saying, you know, we, we, we have to be a little more flexible. Yeah, we can't be in this uh, position indefinitely. It's just not, uh, it's not feasible. How do you measure mental health, as I say to our health team, how do you measure the depression when someone loses their business and they can't pay their mortgage at home? How, how do you measure that? And that's what they need to take into consideration. And, and they do. They really do take that into consideration. Dr. Williams, my chief medical officer, is very, very pragmatic, very pragmatic. We were able to see a spike when this first came out, and then a region of 14 and a half million people, Ontario, we were able to get below 100 cases. So I'm confident we can get below that again. But these business owners, they need hope. That's what they need. They need to know where we're gonna be going. And that's the message I'm getting to our health table, um, that we can't just continue uh, you know, with these heavy, heavy restrictions. People have to be able to earn a living but we have to do it safely. So it's that, it's that balancing act again, uh, Perrin. It's not easy, I can tell you. Premier, you gave a very welcome message to uh, business a little bit earlier when you talked about the need to not raise taxes and to cut red tape and to take a light hand on, on regulation. And that's that'll be very welcome by all of the small business owners in particular who are listening to us today. Can I ask about another area that falls under provincial jurisdiction, and that's interprovincial barriers to trade? Um, we are well into this confederation, and yet we've never achieved the vision of the fathers of confederation of having one market in Canada. Um, surely one of the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic is it's time to stop the partitioning of Canada, where we put up barriers between provinces. What measures is Ontario prepared to take to bring down interprovincial barriers to trade and mobility? When I first got elected, uh, a good friend of mine is Premier Scott Moe in Saskatchewan, and we sat down right away and, and started to push the agenda about getting rid of interprovincial trade. You hear numbers all over. I, I hear anywhere from 50 to $75 billion right down to the GDP 
uh, and that, that, that's huge. People always talk about uh, the, the US MCA deal with, with the US. It's more advantageous. Uh, that, that's great too, don't get me wrong, but it's just as advantageous that we open up the markets of all provinces and, and take down the barriers of protectionism. Because when we did sit down with a lot of the, the premiers, everyone has, okay, well, we'll, we'll open up, but you got to protect this industry or you got to protect that industry. You know, I, I just don't believe that. I think we should open it up, have a, uh, you know, market that's available to all Canadians to do business in. We, we have the largest market. and I'm more than happy to open up the doors. Let's compete against each other. But at least the jobs stay here in Canada opposed to going to the U.S. And <clears throat> sorry, but I, I'm going to jump a little bit uh, with this uh, as, as well. Our procurement system uh, in, in the province, we, we procure tens of billions of dollars. And there has to be a scorecard, and we're changing this now, that gives a benefit to the hometown team. You know, rather than just going with uh, sheer, sheer costs, there has to be some benefit. And if you're manufacturing, for example, here in Ontario, and we're going out for bid, um, out of a scorecard of 100, I'm, I'm throwing out fictitious numbers here, say you get an extra 10 or 20 points, for, for having manufacturing here and saying that, we can't be way, way out to lunch. We still have to be competitive. But I've heard nightmare stories that, you know, companies here in Ontario have lost uh, bids on over $1,000 or a few hundred dollars. That's ridiculous. You know, when you ship out all our jobs somewhere else, that's unacceptable. So I've asked our procurement department to change the rules, but also respect the World Trade Organization uh, but the Americans are experts at it. They're, they're absolutely experts at it, making sure that they, you know, they protect their, I think there's 37 states um, that uh, go by the WTO. And then there's other states that we went down to visit. Off the top of my head, uh, Maryland, uh, Governor Hogan there, uh, Ohio. So there's a few states that that want to do bilateral trade agreements uh, with us. And I'm, I'm open for that. I think that that's great. But again, we have to start giving some hometown advantage uh, to, to the manufacturers here rather than, you know, there, there's one, I'm going to give you a story here. So there, there's a company that's been doing uniforms here for, for the government uh, for years, 25 years. They employ about 50 people in Toronto. And all of a sudden they go for bid, find out, they, they lose the bid, which is unfortunate, but it goes to a Quebec firm. It's Canadian, so that's all right, not a problem. But that Quebec firm outsourced it to Mexico. Really? So we're, we're shipping, uh, you know, some of some our jobs down there, down to Mexico, when even if they're $1,000, who's going to be paying for the 50 people that are being laid off? We, as a tax base, are going to be paying. So if we at least keep the business here and they ha do have to be competitive within reason, you know, that, that's money in people's pockets that they're gonna go out and spend and get our economy going and, and driving the sector. I'm not about protectionism, I'm about protecting our people and our businesses and making sure we'll, we'll compete and give them the environment to compete against every, everyone in the world. And we can compete and we will. Thank you, Premier. In the short time we've left, I want to touch on just two other topics. The first is infrastructure, and the second is skills. Yes. Um, on the subject of infrastructure, what are Ontario's plans in terms of investment in infrastructure as part of the recovery plan? And are you changing the emphasis that you're putting on infrastructure and the types of investments you might make as a result of, of, of COVID? So we're, we're investing $144 billion over the next 10 years in, in projects like a $28.5 billion subway transit plan. That's one of the largest in, in North America. We're investing $27 billion into new hospitals and, and schools. I think it's uh, $16 billion into, into schools, into roads and bridges. Uh, but again, that comes down to making sure that we have the skilled uh, trades uh, available. We're, we're short when it comes to skilled trades. Uh, people. We need more electricians. We need more people in masonry and drywall. I, I could name it all. And we have, 
have to be able to support the industry and we're doing just that. We're working with uh, unions like Leona, for example, uh, pouring money into training facilities right across the, the province. So when we, at least when I grew up, we used to have trade schools, high schools. You'd go in and work on a car, or you'd, you'd do some sort of trade. We need to get back to that because getting involved in a trade is a job for life. And then once you're involved in the trade, be the true entrepreneur. Say, say you get, uh, you're becoming an electrician. Open your own company. Hire more people. That's what it's all about, is making sure we give people the opportunities to get involved in trades. And trades is not a bad word. Maybe 25 years ago, 30 years, everyone wanted their, their son or daughter to be a lawyer or a doctor. Get involved in the trade. You're making some real serious, serious money. We need it, and it's a job for life. But we're going to continue pouring money, like, like the country has never seen, into infrastructure projects. And I'm a big believer in public-private partnerships as, as well, getting the, the private sector involved, making sure that jobs are on time, on budget, as they do in infrastructure. Structure Ontario, some of the brightest minds out there uh, anywhere in the world. We're actually outsourcing some of our resources uh, to other areas when they need help. And or I shouldn't say outsourcing, we're, we're selling our expertise to uh, other regions around the world because we have an A-team uh, in Infrastructure Ontario and they're, they're doing a great job. So I encourage, no matter if it's a tunneling project, a highway project, tollways or whatever, we need the private sector involved as well. Well, Premier, you've covered off the two areas that I was, was going to ask about of infrastructure and trade, and I thank you for that. Premier, thank you so much for being with us today, and thank you for the leadership that you've shown yeah. throughout the pandemic. The, the, the message that you gave today about uh, the support that you're providing for business is something that's enormously encouraging to all of us. We deeply appreciate the partnership that you've developed with the private sector, with the Ontario Chamber and others, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Good luck luck of, in your efforts on behalf of the people of Ontario. You know, so Perrin, thank you, and I want to thank all the people uh, on this uh, conference. Uh, you're the reason we're doing well. You're the reason why we've created 50,000 new manufacturing jobs, 168,000 jobs last month. Folks, let's keep it going. Let's stick together, and we will take on the world, and we will win. Thank you. I appreciate it, and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you again. Catherine, back over to you. Thank you, Perrin. That was a great conversation and it really underlines that, um, boy, it is a tough time to govern. But you really do get a sense that Premier Ford understands very clearly clearly what businesses are going through day to day during COVID. It's also really interesting to hear how bullish and upbeat he is about Ontario and Canada's uh, potential post COVID. It's certainly reassuring, but it was um, very engaging conversation